Well, I think this record is even less easy listening than the previous record, The Benz. And when The Benz came out, a lot of people said there were no singles on it. And I think with this one, I think it's even more the case of that. But I think, you know, we don't really think of music in terms of singles. Although we think of each song in isolation, we don't, you know, there's nothing like conceptual or progressive about the music. It's it's every every piece of music that we, every song we do, we try and treat differently, um, production-wise. I mean, this is the first album we produced ourselves as well. So um, it's a very yeah it's a dense record you know I can I mean we always try really hard to combat the skip culture of the CD format um, by trying to make people sit down and listen to this in one sitting but I think this is less like that compared to the bends if you see, see what I mean I think but I think that. You know, I, I'm quite happy if people just want to dive into this record and extract stuff from it because I think emotionally it, each like piece of music is very intense. So I think people will get a lot from it. What is your mood like uh, when you're in the process of recording? You put in an um, well, it varies. I mean, collectively, I suppose it's one of that's a good question of neuro. <laughs> Neurosis, um, of uncertainty, um, of excitement, of uh, boredom, of lots of things, you know, I mean, it depends, I mean, you know, you can do your best recording and you don't realise that uh, until you hear it being played back, so, um, uh, just our mood, uh, on this record, it's quite stressful because we were constantly aware of the fact that we were producing the album ourselves, so, my agenda, my personal agenda on this record was that I wanted to try and enjoy as much of the recording process as possible. It's very important because the last record had been quite difficult. In what way? Um, in that we'd been recording in London, which we didn't find at the time agreeable. And that we were going through sort of growing pains as a group because it was our first like big album to do. Um, so I really wanted to try and enjoy as much of the experience as possible and some of it was enjoyable and some of it wasn't and I think it's always going to be like that. Um, so um, a combination of moods and things really. Now this album definitely arrives with high expectation. Yes. Um, not just, in, not really so much in terms of commercially it seems but a critical thing. Yeah, how does, how does that Well, feel? it's, it's you know, I mean, it's very flattering that we've got, like, five stars in Q magazine in England and ten out of ten in the NME and um, stuff like that. But the important thing is that we recorded the album in isolation. Uh, we recorded it in this old country house in this deserted valley in the middle of England in the countryside, and we recorded... 30% of it in this run-down apple farm that we rehearse in. And in fact, we rehearsed and arranged and uh, m most of the bends in as well, just outside Oxford. So, um, you know, we spend a lot of our time, or we try to spend a lot of our time, like, outside of that kind of, um, that kind of attention and, and coverage. So... Obviously, it's nice to get good reviews, but we were we were kind of in a fortunate position because when we started, we had a big single called Crete on Pablo Honey, and then critically we were we were ignored or um, uh, attacked because people thought we were a one-hit band and we didn't really have anything to follow up Creep on Pablo Honey, so that was which was fair enough. But then you know I would also say that was a record we recorded in two and a half weeks, so you know. It, and, and it had a much longer shelf life than it really deserved because of the success of Creep, and, and we didn't expect it to. So you know, we expected to record the Benz quite shortly afterwards. You know, but well, it was a year and a half late over. You know, it's two and a half years later. So you, I read that Q magazine article. Yeah, that's like a that's called, it's quite an old piece now in the press kit. I mean, that's like a preview piece. 
Um, yeah, it, and it, at this, um, yeah, and I guess it is. Um, I, I'm just, I was really fascinated by what you guys went through mm. after the success of Creep, because I'll be very honest, I really didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware of what was going on with the band. Um, was that a difficult time? for you? I mean, you're traveling around and, and, and you're successful, right? Mm. You know, people... Yeah, but on the back of one song. Yeah, with, with, yeah it's very that? difficult because it was like a pop hit, especially in America because it was such a big hit in America. And I think it took us a long time to sort of get our heads together about it. So um, it was a difficult time. It was very difficult. Yeah. Um, but uh, we came through it and, you know, we survived that as a group and... Um, you know, it, I think the main reason why we survived the experience of like having a big success of one single and then like having people sort of fall away from us after that was that we'd been together as a group and played music together since we were like 14 years old when we were all at school together. So I think the fact that we had that history behind us was very important. Um, when we signed to EMI in the winter of 1991, we thought that at the time, the most important thing was the fact that we were like signed to a major record company with a contract as professional musicians, and that the friendship thing, which we'd had before then as a group, and the reasons we were playing music together, would be like a secondary thing. But the longer we do this, and the more we meet people whose music we love and admire, like you two or REM or loads of people, you know, we realise who are groups of people who've known each other for a long time. We realise now that the friendship thing is like really important. It is the more important thing to keep you going and successful and happy and sane, rather than the uh, career, so-called professionalism thing. I, I do get a sense that you guys are very uh, accepting of each other. And well, we have to be. You have to be very patient. That's very well a good observation. I mean, we're very patient with. We never go into a studio unless we've worked out what we're going to play and like, all the parts and stuff. We hardly ever do, hardly ever. Um, we have to be very patient with each other because technically, you know, it varies between person to person on like their abilities on on the ins instruments. It's not like we're not a group of like session players who can play every single style perfectly. But it's good to have limitations, you know. It's good to have boundaries. It's very important in creativity to have limits because it gives you something to um, frame what you're doing uh, if, if, if it's going well uh, or it gives you something to rail against or try and like overcome and struggle against you know if things aren't going well so they're both they're both see so it's very important you know so yeah you're very again it's, it's, it's a very good point and it means also you'll try things unorthodoxly and differently from conventional approaches because you don't know what the conventional approach is or style or technique is. Um, so yeah, so that we have to be. Everyone is very patient with with each other. Now, what about this um, kind of love hate relationship with the progressive rock? Well, this is something that's been like you know tagged on to us. I mean, you know, I mean about the new record more than anything. I think. The record was, uh, excuse me, God, forgive me, I was, so a friend called me at 5.30 in the morning from England thinking it was, you know, got the time wrong. So I'm sorry, I had my sleep interrupted. No, no, I know how these, how grueling these things are anyway. Yeah, thank you. Okay, right, so the progressive thing. Okay, well, like, the interesting comment that I like to, to make is that, you know how important it is to master an album? had to master a record. Um, this record was mastered by a gentleman called Chris Blair, who masters like loads of people in England, like Morrissey, Oasis. He's, he's one of the most important people for the job. He's like the Bob Ludwig or Harry Weinberger for the UK. And um, he mastered the Benz. Right? And with the Benz, well, we, we edited a lot of stuff and sped things up and changed a lot of stuff at the last moment. And I asked him, like, on the second day we were mastering Abbey Road for the OK Computer, what was the big differences between the two records sonically for him? And he said to me that he'd been working at Abbey Road now for, like, nearly 20 years, over 20 years, and, like, the OK Computer reminded him a lot of records that were recorded in Abbey Road, and all brought to him to be mastered at the time in the 70s. And these, there were albums that were recorded by a band with an engineer as opposed to, like, a producer and had a kind of more open sort of 
spacious sound, less compressed, you know, like with the bends, and more delicate sounding and more extreme at the same time, um, less just one sort of sonic level. And that was what he was going to try and bring out, that kind of return to that kind of 70s sound on the record. And um, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that it reminded him of that, that 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 kind of thing, you know, the time when people like the Floyd and I don't know, loads of people were recording in Abbey Road in the seventies, late mid seventies. So it's progressive rock, you know. I mean, you know, my brother Johnny is kind of like the person who like has called the like the Genesis and the um, Floyd collections and stuff, and and he has this thing about he's always trying to find. <laughs> Some good progressive rock music, and he never does really find it. He says it's all generally terrible. Um, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, some of the Floyd is you could say it's progressive rock, but not all of it, obviously. Um, so it's not really, you know, it's nothing really to do with us. How did your sound develop? I mean, if I was to listen to you guys back in your uh, well, when we started, we were at school. We had like three saxophones. We were a pop band. We were like. The main, because when we started at school, because this is another thing, this is another reason, it's interesting looking back how much it has informed how we behave now. Because we started, we always started for our own entertainment and because we were to a stave of boredom. We all went to this school, it was a public, a private school. Um, it was boys only and it was not very good. It was creatively very, very uh, oppressive. And so we started the band to try and escape, like to create our own sort of creative space within this insular, um, stifling environment. And we would rehearse and play a lot in the music school and village halls around Ox Abingdon, Oxford. But we wouldn't do any shows. We did like our first concert when we were 16 years old and we all wore black and played very loud because we thought that's what you had to do. So they didn't really change things there. Um, but we never really, you see, we were always quite insular, you know. We, we never really, we, you know, it's not like we got together. We got together to play the music for ourselves. It's not like we had this, like, you know, we want to go and play in London and be noticed straight away and stuff like that. It's, that's always been, like, a secondary factor to us. It's, we've never done the music as a sort of paving stone way, paving to, to, to recognition or fame, you know. And so we've always had that quality of like, you know, we all still live in Oxford, of, of, of being like a bit removed or just outside from London or from what, where things are happening or things that people are reporting from, you know, from, from the age of like 14 onwards. That's interesting. I, um, well, I just want to go back to one thing for a second. I've always wanted to know, what is it like to record in Abbey Road? Abbey Road, it's fantastic. I mean, it's an institution first and foremost. I mean, like, 15 years ago, they all, all the engineers and people had to wear, like, white lab coats still, you know. Not anymore, but, like, 15 years ago. It's, um, you know, I mean, we recorded, like, some of the bends in Studio 2, which is obviously the Beatles' room. Um, and uh, we did some string overdubs. We only did string overdubs, I think, on this record uh, in Studio 2 this time. And, uh, I mean, we did a lot more of the bends in Abbey Road. Um, um, it's an institution. It's, that's the important thing about Abbey Road is it's like a, it's like a hospital or a, I don't know. It's great, but it's like, you know, it's not like a farmhouse, like, with a, with a great, like, kitchen with great food and, like, a, just a big old space that you can record in. It's, you are in a, a EMI corporate thing, but the people there are fantastic. I mean, and again, the people there, you could criticise them because they're all like, this is how we've done this thing for like 10, 15, 25 years, so, and it's good, so why should we change it, you know? And there was this whole thing about mastering the the, the, the new, the, the Beatles reissues, it was like, should it be digitally or ana analogue? Should it be DDD or um, AAD, master, remastered? Um, so there's a lot of people there who are kind of, you know, very stuck in their ways. But it's amazing, you know, it's an amazing experience. And um, and it's in like a kind of crappy part of London. It's in St John's Wood, which is really lovely, but really expensive. So it's not like, you know, there aren't any sort of cool clubs or bars. But I mean, you know, so there's good and bad things, but, but on the whole, great. Yeah, no, and I can imagine going against that tradition particularly. Ooh, well, you know, like Johnny played Hammond on... Um, 
fake plastic trees on the bends, and then it's the same Hammond that John Lennon played on, you know, on Abbey Road and stuff. And there's a picture of him playing as Hammond, you know. And like they say that you can like, there's this room at the end of Studio Two, this little box room, where the Beatles used to like do their reefer, and you can like inhale, and you can like still smell the reefer coming out of the room, you know, from the sixties. Now, how about the, uh, in in terms of, I mean, obviously you guys aren't the Beatles status, and, and no, but, no, um, <laughs> but <laughs> thank God for that. But um, how are you? dealing with the fame and the attention? Well, I mean, last, on Monday night we did this gig at Irving Plaza in New York and it was ridiculous, like U2 was there and R.E.M. and Madonna and um, Brad Pitt and uh, people like that, ridiculous. And, you know, I don't know, it's nice when you meet people who you really admire and you like what they, what they do and, they, 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 and they're really... And it's reassuring to see that, like, eighty, nine times out of ten, they're, like, decent people. They behave decently, like Oasis. They're really cool, really nice people who, who just care about music. So, you know. Um, and so that's, that's... Again, you see, it's, like, it's very difficult to respond to that question because it's not something that we got into doing this for or even consider... And to be honest with you, the good thing about meeting people in music principally who we admire, who are successful, uh, is if we want to do some stuff with them. Because of like, you know, we met, but it's more stuff like more dance stuff at the moment, like Massive Attack and uh, some Moax stuff. It's a guy called DJ Shadow who's from San Francisco. He's going to try doing some remixing off a track called Subterranean, Homesicalian on the album. Um, so, I mean, it's not real. I mean, and the other thing as well, for a lot of these people, that you, all it is is like, you know, in New York there's a lot of people around and it was like a hot gig to go to and it's like the spotlight and then next week it'll be someone else, you know, someone else's thing, so. And we I mean, ultimately we all go back to like Oxford where like we've lived since well, I was born in Oxford, so you know we've lived for a long time, so it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I, I can. That's definitely balancing. Yeah, it's balance. like Athens, I suppose. I mean, you know, for the REM people, I hope. Um, you you guys don't really seem to factor into the kind of competition between, you know, like Blur and Oasis and that. No, no, but again, you see, it goes back to like always being like outside of London and outside of, it's very important, you know, because that would be appalling if like the music that we were trying to do was driven by like, you know, before on the onset of recording was driven by a kind of like where it was going to take us uncompetitively un against other people. You know, I don't. That's not. That's not the plot at all. <laughs> so you know, we're definitely not a group of people who like. Oh, we've seen people play like big theatres or stadiums. Like, oh, we want to do. See, I was thinking about this. It's like that's why there's this whole thing about stadium rock and like really terrible stuff by people like Simple Minds and things. What those people were doing in the '80s was that they had the, the stadium thing, and they were trying to like write music. It was like writing music to, for a lifestyle. If you see what I mean, it should like music should be like a soundtrack. If it's good music, it should be evocative and a soundtrack for your life. But you can't really, you know, and uh, you have to be very talented to be able to like write music as you would write a ticket for where you wanted to go. If you see what I mean, you know, it's like I want to play stadium, so I shall write stadium rock music that will be really successful, but pl plays in stadiums. And that's what all those bands were trying to do in the 80s. They wanted to do, like, write music to fulfil the lifestyle of, like, playing these places, if you see what I mean. Rather than writing about, you know, you know, you, know. you can't, you can't, you can't, you know, that'd be appalling. Do, 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 you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You know? That's a really obvious point, but, I mean, it's like... No, I don't think it is an obvious point. You know, it? uh, no. It's <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, what's it like? It's like... It's like attempting to sort of, it's like, uh, you know, I, I want to go to Hawaii and live there, so I'm going to, you know, 
do X and X. It's like wish fulfillment, you know. It's like, you know, I can do this thing to play, to play stadium, so I'm going to write this kind of music. And it's like, that's not, that's not how. That's not what should motivate you. It's not what motivates us. That's that's. So thing, what you know. does motivate you guys? Um, well, I mean, the main songwriter is Tom, the singer. Um, and he does, I. Most of the songs like on acoustic guitar, and, and he, it's his melodies and lyrics. Um, and then we just like take the, like the bones of the songs <laughs> and arrange them and write stuff around them and write the parts and, and arrange it. And um, Johnny writes some of the music as well, my brother. And one of the things we learned on this record is that you can't write a song on an acoustic guitar and then record it and take out the acoustic guitar. You can't do that. It doesn't work like that. What, how did you discover this? Because and, and you had got a, the first song on the record called Airbag. And Tom wanted to try it by cutting some beats up like like, like um, DJ Shadow, my uncle. And... Um, it's done. It on the I'm sorry, my friend won't react. You have to forgive me. <laughs> it's very rude of me. Um, no, no. If, anyway, so you cut these beats out that Phil played live and put onto the. Just it was all really rough, you know. I mean, it's all really rough and it's all they're not in time and everything, but it's great, really exciting. And then he took, played it with a guide acoustic, a guide like electric, and then got rid of it, and it just wasn't as good. I said. Got, I said, I've got to put it back, it's got to be there, so put it in, and it's like, great, again. <laughs> so just stuff like that, you know. You can't, you can't take something that is like, has some kind of like organic acoustic bass and relatively quickly try and make it into something that's a program, piece of program music. I mean, you know, I mean, it's possible to, to sort of combine styles and things, and that's the exciting thing, to make something different and new out of like different approaches. But, I mean, the whole programming thing as well takes a long time. Your relationship with with your brother. Uh, yes. And, and, um, you know what? What is it? A lot of people wouldn't want to work with a relative of any kind, and you do. What is what is it like? It's um, it's it's very good. Um, he has a very dry sense of humour. He's a very funny guy. He's very gentle. He's very polite. It's a very English sense of humour. I mean, he very much enjoys playing up the Englishman in America. Um, when Americans say, you know, how are you today, sir? And um, he says, well, I'm jolly fine, thank you for asking, and how is your good self, or something, you know, whatever. Which is a bit disorientating. But he, you know, really enjoys being here, and a lot of his favourite music is American, obviously, you know, from... You know, the old jazz stuff, he's a big, like, jazz fan, like Jimmy Smith and stuff like that, and through to, you know, loads of stuff, obviously. Um, he only ever loses his um, mellowness when he's ill, sense of humor when he's ill. Um, and he's very mature for 25 this year, 24, now he's 24, so... And, uh, so how do your parents feel? Oh, it's just my mother and... Um, Initially, she was like, my God, my God, you know, I mean, she had me down. I was going to be like an academic or a lawyer, and Johnny was going to be like a, uh, some kind of musician, but in, after going to college, and he dropped out of college to be in the band because he was the youngest person when we were signed, and he was just doing through his first term at college in Oxford, and he, and he had to drop out. So he was helped by that, by this one of his tutors in psychology and music, this guy called Charlie. I don't know if you read a book, you know, a writer called Hanif Kurashai called The Buddha of Suburbia, and it's about, like, um, it's about this guy who lives up in suburban London, and, and anyway, one of, this, one, of this, one of the protagonist's friends goes to New York and, like, is in a punk rock band and hangs out. And anyway, this was Charlie, and he used to live with Iggy Pop, and um, he's my brother's teacher, and he's, like, the character in this book. And so when Johnny said, I'm going to want to be in a rock band, the teacher goes, go for it, you know? So that was fine. That's wow. Yeah. Uh, let's see what's... Um, and, and this other thing, you guys are nice. Ah, <laughs> nice. What a, what a damning word in the wrong hands, though. <laughs> like, a, like a girl's hands, you know. The moment she says a guy's nice, you know. <laughs> You're fucked. You're not fucked.
Anyway, sorry. Nice, what polite. <laughs> Actually, it's funny, it <laughs> digresses from my original point, but that's true, isn't mm. it? That's the kiss of death. Yeah, that and cute. Well, cute can be a bit ambiguous, but cute can be quite... More England, if someone says you're cute, then... Although it's changing, actually. I mean, it's more promising now. There's more chance of a, of a relationship with someone that says you're cute of attraction. Well, cute used to be, like, nice. It used to be, like, forget it. Anyway. Do you, do you get those? No, I don't. We don't well, mm, no, because, we, you know, obviously we're not the most sort of glamorous group of guys in the world. And, it's again, it's not what we were doing it for. And we used to get press in the UK which said, like, you know, they look like five of... Five ugly misfits in a police identity parade and stuff like this, and you know, and this new issue of Select, it was terrible pictures of us. We were already tired. You know, Select's music magazine UK, and like the the copies, like Relax Girls, they're all like they've all got partners or something, you know, which isn't true anyway. But I mean, it's like you know, we do look terrible, so you know. But I, I don't give a fuck about it. We don't really give a fuck about it. I mean, it's just really just hysterical when you meet like these models who come and see the gig and it's like, oh yeah. Alright. Thank you for coming. Do, do you, I mean, do you worry that if people are paying more attention to you that it's because, not because of who you are or even what you do? Well, yeah, but I mean, that you should never assume that people are paying attention to you because of who you are. If you, if you think that, you're, 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 you're damned, you're doomed. You should never think that. That's got nothing to do with this. You know, that, that, that would, like, you know, nobody knows who we are. And I, and I hope they never do. So, you know, on, on one level, obviously. Uh, you know, I think, you know, I think that's appalling. I mean, I, you know, I would never presume that I would know who my, like, heroes are, like Stipe or um, Eitzel or, um, you know, Joy Division magazine, um, Soul, Hal Green, you know. That would be an intrusion on intimacy um, and, and I don't want to because I, 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 it, there's a difference between that and like if you see what I mean it's like I, I would never assume that I know these people's minds but I'd like to think I know how I feel about the songs you know about the characters and, and all these people's music you know and, I, and that's an, I don't want to know I don't want to intrude upon like what they're really like because it would destroy how I see the songs in my head because my interpretation of this stuff is always going to be different from theirs because music that they've created has punctuated my life. It's not, you know, the soundtrack to their lives that, that I'm interested in. It's the soundtrack to my life and music. That's okay. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. That's, I, I, th I think that's ideal, but I guess what, I, what I'm not worried about, but the other... But you can't prevent people from not treating your music in the same way. You can't prevent people, be they, you know, big, small, important, unimportant, whatever, mm -hmm. from thinking, ah, I've heard this music, I know mm -hmm. who these guys are. You can't... Right, no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but, so but, but, but it's not us, obviously, I mean, you know, I don't think, I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone, I mean, and I think when, when people have, like, done interviews or done pieces where they've, like, been very accurate about things, I mean, there's, there's a real angle you can do about us as well, which is quite sort of dyspeptic and, um, mm, critical, and it's completely fair enough, but it's, like, it's, it's, it's just, like, it's, it's very limiting, I mean, we've had, like, a couple of pieces, like, been like that years ago, but, I mean, it's like this kid turned up to the hotel the other day and he'd driven like 1200 miles and it was like he was like a big fan he wanted to get into the show and we couldn't get him in because it's like just impossible and it's like you know and he was like really upset about it and he was like well you know but then you know if like you know one of my heroes is playing I'm not going to castle them you know it's like I wouldn't I wouldn't really want that much contact you know between the and I've met like some of my heroes, and it's and it's it's a strange it's a strange thing, you know, because really they have in the flesh nothing to do with their music, in a way. I, if I can explain that of of how you like their music, you know, it's it's completely, you know, that that kind of magic, that ingredient, that special like X, it's still secret when you meet them. And that's great. I really think that's great. So who, I mean, who are, tell me about... Well, you know, people like Stipe and Mills and R.E.M. people and U2 and 
Makite. So Mark McCall, he came to the gig in New York. Yeah, you know, band called Miracle Legion. A really good first two albums on Rough Trade. Really good. People like that. I didn't meet him though. He's big Tom and Tom's brothers, big fans of his. So um, how do your Oasis? It's just courtesy, really. You know. You must, I mean, since you guys all knew each other from... Maybe, Age 14, whatever, 12, 13, 14, 13, how, 14. How do your, like, your fellow peers, the people that you knew at the same time, how do they regard you? I mean, do you still keep up the tab? Yeah, vaguely. Well, not really at school so much because, um, you know, we all split up, went to different colleges and stuff. But, you know, it, it there was a very difficult period about two years ago where the novelty of doing this had worn off amongst our friends and ourselves and it was now like a job and so it's very difficult psychologically to maintain friendships at a certain point because you go away for like up to like two months at a time two and a half and come back and then go away again and meanwhile your friends have got on with their lives obviously, and doing their own things in London and Oxford, say, or, or wherever. And um, what happens is it, it, they go from, it goes from like, oh, wow, you just come back from, wow, you've been to, like, done this for the first time, to like, oh, well, you're doing this, you're doing that. Do you know what I mean? What, has bec what was magical becomes commonplace, but still removed from, from their experience and vice versa. And it's like, you know, you can kind of drift out of touch with people, which is... Uh, not drift out of touch, but but yeah, you do. But people don't hold it against you, and that's kind of bad in a way because it's like, well, you know, he's going to be doing this and this and this. So, you know, I won't write to him, you know, two months later maybe, or but I won't expect anything from Colin. So until whenever. So it's difficult. It's very difficult. So what made it not feel like a job again? Um, I think sort of reclaiming some ground really of the reasons that we started doing this which was doing our own record really obviously the success at the moment in the UK it's very exciting obviously that's that's good and just feeling a bit of stability and security um, you know um, um, so yeah I think those are the things that, that are making it sort of interesting again do you, just to look specifically at this album, because it occurs to me I should ask some questions about that, but do you have a, a, a favorite song? Um, not really. I mean, I have like songs I'm not so keen on. i got just a couple of things uh, that, you know, I kind of like are unhappy about. But I'd say 80% uh, of it I'm very happy with and very proud of. So, you know, and, and for a first effort of like producing it ourselves, I think that's a good strike rate, you know, definitely. But if I was to select songs, I really love The Tourist at the end, and I really like um, Exit Music for a film. I like Airbag, and I like, you know, I like No Surprises. Our last three songs, it's No Surprises, Lucky, and The Tourist, I think are really wonderful. What, um, the, also the video. Um, Paranoid Android. You see, I really like that as well. You see, that was just the, the song, Paranoid Android, was just... Well, again, you see, we all had different approaches to, to lots of stuff. You see, we all come from different directions. And, like, one of the things we were trying to do collectively with, was we were into this whole thing about... We'd done it on the bends where we, like, digitally edited a couple of bits of music together and done, like, kind of brutal, like, editing where you just, like, bits of music, you splice it together, you know, like Beatles on, like, you know, on... Um, Magical Mystery Tour or whatever and um, we really wanted to try that just to see if we could like make musical sense out of disparate elements and overall and a piece of music so that's, so that's what we did with Paranoid Android and it was just like supposed to be it, I mean it's I mean we, we, we it was kind of one of the first things we finished on the sessions and we'd listen to it and we'd just giggle we felt like sort of irresponsible schoolboys who were like just doing this like you know this thing that was just a bit of fun you know there's a lot of humor in it there's a lot of twisted humor we'd always giggle at the end of listening to it because we felt we'd just done this like really naughty thing you know 
because nobody does like a six and a half minute song, you know, with like all these changes. It's like ridiculous. But then, you know, a lot of the dance stuff, like um, DJ Shadow and stuff like that, he, that's kind of what he was doing on his debut album, introducing. He was trying to take like disparate pieces of music and try and put them together in one piece as a sort of collage of things, but the, in a way that made sense, you know. Um, so we were like really inspired by that. Do you do the songs have a meaning for you? You didn't write. No, I didn't write the words or the melodies. So I mean, do the songs, and and you can speak for the other members of the band if you yeah. like. Yeah. But do you when you do you say this song means? Well, this when to Tom, me? when Tom, we did, when Tom does a vocal take when we're playing, say, and it's if it's really good or if he's really happy with it, he says that he knows when something has a meaning for him musically and the song is good for him because he sees pictures inside his head like really vivid imagery which I really like um, I really like that I'm, I mean I really I think I'm, I, I do like his lyric, lyric writing I think he's very good I think he's he has a right combination of the oblique and the um, uh, powerful in terms of like imagery um, and I think I like what he's trying to do with this record where he tries to he was trying to like just have lots of different voices and different angles and different approaches and try to be less internalized I mean you know we had some criticism for the title of this record OK Computer because because it's quite general um, now are you guys I was reading one of the press releases are you guys going to you going to do videos for every one of the songs and they're all going to be it's like it's like yeah it's 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 an ambition rather than a set in stone for the simple reason, two reasons of time and money. Because it's so expensive and we can't afford to spend loads of money on videos. We should be spending on music. Did but, that, I mean, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Now what you, now what you well, does, I guess, but does that, if, if it's even an intention, then does that mean that you see the songs as being linked in some way that it is kind. I don't want to call it concept. No, I, I don't think I don't think the songs will be. I mean, because of the different media that we're doing these three videos. I mean, there's paranoid Android videos done by a guy called Magnus Carlson, and um, it's based in Stockholm. And it's animation, it's cartoon, and then we're doing a video for a song called Let Down, which is uh, stop motion collage animation. Like it's kind of more much more basic, but. Uh, and I don't have a clue how it will look. It could look really good. It might be a bit strange. Done by a group of artists who just graduated from Royal College last year called Straw Donkey, who have had some really cool animation put up on uh, the new U2 tour. They've got some of their stuff up on the big L, the big TV screen. It's just amazing. So, and then Karma Police, which is like Tom uh, in this kind of like nightmare sort of car journey which was filmed in Norfolk last week by a gentleman called two weeks ago, three weeks ago, well, about three weeks ago, by a guy called John Glazer, who directed Street Spirit video. So, there's going to be lots of different things mixed up and mixed and match. Now, one personal question, as long as we're on videos, can you please explain high and dry video to me? Which one? The, the, oh, the, the, the robbery one? Yeah, the diner. Well, it was just like, I mean, you know, retrospectively, I don't think it was like one of our best videos, but I mean, I, I kind of like the spirit that it was done in. I mean, it was obviously just like a Pulp Fiction pastiche, and it was this guy's first directorial, serious directing got job. But I kind of like it. I mean, I like it despite the fact that it's, it, it, it's probably the least... Uh, original of the videos that we've done for the bands, um, and the plot is that these two guys, this, this man and this woman, have done a bank job, and they um, are going over to give the the money or whatever the safe deposit thing to the meet someone in the diner, and in return they get like paid for the job, but of course they they, they open the thing and it's not their money, it's a bomb, so they get screwed. So. Yeah, I guess it's pretty much what it seemed. I just didn't know if there was like a linkage to this. And and the guy, the guy, the businessman, and the thing is like the guy who gets the um, the couple into the bank. Who's the inside? And he's okay. killed as well. That's so, right. That's right. You know. And the, this the, the Magnus Car Magnus Anderson. The Magnus Carlson, Magnus who did Paranoid Android. That, it's got nothing to do with High and Dry. No, no, exactly. That, but that other that 
just thinking of your videos, I find that that one was the, the animation for that. Oh, Paranoid Android. Or Paranoid Android was just amazing. Well, it's the reason why we really like it as well. It's like the first time we watched it, we thought, oh no, is this just like a Robin cartoon? Robin is kind of like a sort of twisted Swedish beaded Beavis and Butthead, but but much but but I don't know, a lot of friends, I I, mean, I never really got into Beavis and Butthead, but a lot of people really like it. But anyway, um, Tom really likes it, Beavis and Butthead. But um, anyway, uh, what was my point? Magnus animation, yeah. Um, but watching it a few times, it's like it's really well put together, and the imagery of like loads of stuff, the angel and the helicopter and the the river and. The rain down section is probably the most successful bit, actually, the middle section. It's so well done. It's very interesting how he um, drew and realized the, the video for the song um, because Ed and Phil and the band met him when they were doing some press in Sweden. Uh, anyway, he's a very quiet chap. He looks like Robin. He looks like Robin in the video. And... Um, he just got up in the morning and he put on like a paranoid android like nine in the morning and he just spent like 12 hours just playing it over and over again, not seeing anyone, just writing lots of stuff down that he thought would be cool. And this beautiful sunny day in Stockholm, like with his windows open and it's like a flat, just looking out over the city and just thinking about, you know, just brainstorming himself about what was, what was going on in his head and in the song. And um, and we're all very happy with it, and it's one of our favourite things, really. Yeah. yeah, it's very particularly with the song. It just each one kind of casts a different interpretation on the other. Yeah, it kind of makes it a third. Thing. Yeah, there's a censorship thing in the America as well, which which completely bemuses and baffles us because it's like there's a scene where this politician figure is like wearing this like leather codpiece and he chops off his arms and legs when he's trying to hack on the lamppost. And that's fine over here, but um, for some reason, like the mermaids, like in the original, you can see their breasts, and like we had to like get them covered over with like swimming costumes in America, because for some reason, like you know, a bit of like violence is okay, but any sex or like a woman's body, it's like no. And it's like, hang on a minute. I mean, we to be honest, to be perfectly frank with you, we could have kind of understood like if they had a problem with some guy chopping his arms and legs off. But I mean, you know, women's breasts and mermaids as well. You know, it's like oh, fucked up. So back one final group of questions for you. Uh, you should actually probably take that. Right? Yeah, I should get some food actually. That's what I need. Then just back to this the the nice or polite issue yeah. in the sense that you guys. I mean, in terms of it came up in the Q article. I mean, you're not. You don't fit the kind of wild partying right, yeah. image, not only yeah. of stereotypical rockers, yeah, but yeah. that some of your fellow contemporary yeah, bands okay, are living yeah. out for yeah, wildly. Yeah, sure, I'm sure. just, is that something that, how, why, do you feel pressure to be more partiers, or I guess that, you know, deals with the same thing you're out in Oxford? Well, I stayed up till like half five in the morning um, in, in New York, and we had to get up at eight o'clock to fly to the Los Angeles, you know, after we played the plaza, so that was quite rock and roll. But I mean, you know, I bet like, if you're on tour like seven months out of a year, then you can't really, eight months rather, you can't burn the candle all the time because your performance suffers. You know, I went to see a band called the Charlatans play in the UK towards the end of the tour and they were already tired because, and the performance wasn't that great because they were obviously, you know, being, and then I found out later it was because they, you know, spent a lot of time doing the party thing, which is great, fine, you know. And, and do you agree with, the assessment that you guys are kind of polite, friendly. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I don't know. It's not, I'm sorry if it's really boring, but you know.